Well, thanks for joining us. Uh, welcome. I'm here with Wyatt Houts, or also known as the Post Bardian. Um, I'm excited here to talk about a little bit of his journey uh, leading up to Bart. Um, he's a, a writer who's done some really great work in the blogosphere uh, with his Post Bardian. Uh, for me personally, he's introduced me to a lot of really good theologians, and um, I've benefited a lot from his uh, writing, from his articles. And so I know a lot of you have as well. Um, and so, yeah, just want to say thank you so much for what you've done, but also thanks for joining us here to have a little chat. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate the invitation. You know, we've been friends for a long time. I've always enjoyed your books. Uh, it's been fun to review them and to see your journey as well. And I feel like many of the stages I've gone through, you've kind of followed that same path on your own. In some ways, you know, if you've gone further than I have. So it's been, uh, it's, it's been iron sharpening iron you know, yeah. knowing you over the years. So I was oh, yeah, for excited sure. to get together and do this. And we've been meaning to do this for a long time. Yeah, definitely. No, and I've always appreciated you reviewing my books. I think that's been such a such, such blessing for me as well to hear that good feedback and, and some of the criticisms you brought and stuff were good too. So yeah, I thought it's been it's been really good. Um, but uh, cool. Well, I, um, I figured we just start off, I think, as someone who also really just relates uh, to books and theology books, especially really well. Um, I, I think a good way to start off to kind of introduce you is to talk about um, actually what was one of my favorite uh, articles that you wrote, which was called 15 Books Defining My Autobiography. And so it was about seven years ago that you wrote this. You wrote it in 2015. Um, and I just wanted to ask if you still agreed with that list and if maybe you can explain a little bit more of the reasoning behind the books that you listed here. Um, and so just for a refresher of yourself and then everybody that's listening, um, the 15 books that you listed were John Piper's Desiring God, uh, George Ladd's uh, the Theology of the New Testament, John Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Re Religion, uh, N.T. Wright's Christian Origins and the, Christ and the Question of God, um, Yaroslav Pelikan's The Christian Tradition, Karl Barth Church Dogmatics, of course, uh, Friedrich Schleiermacher's Christian Faith, uh, Jonathan Edwards' Ethical Writings, Hans Kuhn's The Church, Maltman's The Crucified God, Karl Reiner's Theological Investigations, especially Volumes 1 and 4. Uh, Maltman's The Coming of God. Um, I always mispronounce his name. Maybe you can help me. Uh, Dimitri Stanilo. Stanilo yeah, I say Stanilo. I, I just, it's, <laughs> it's, this is part of the problem with theology readers. You know, it's yeah. like you read all these big names and you have your own pronunciation in your mind. And then you go speak them out loud in sort of a group and you, you sound like a fool. It's like that flowchart of how do you pronounce us? Um, Kierkegaard. It's a Kierkegaard. Yeah. <laughs> you know, no matter what you do, you lose. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, I relate to this as well. I always have to look up actually how to pronounce these things. Um, but yeah, his, however you say his name, his uh, Orthodox Dogmatic Theology, um, Drutung Center's Eucharist and Ecumenism, and then Hans Kuhn's Justification. Um, so that was your original list, um, which I thought was really interesting. There's many of those that I would say as well, obviously. Bart's Church Dogmatics for myself, Schleiermacher, Maltman. Um, but I wonder if you could talk through maybe if you would have that same list, if there's any you'd remove or maybe some of the, um, obviously it's a massive list. So we don't have to talk about every single book, but as just a way to introduce a little bit of you and your story. Yeah, it's just anytime I go back to something I wrote years ago, I'm like, oh, oh no, what did I say? <laughs> it's, it's just something will come back to me that I didn't expect, you know, or, you know, it comes up in a flare on Twitter every once in a while. Of yeah. something that I had done and I get tagged on it and I'm like, oh, what, what I what I liked about this post um, when I wrote it was I was trying to be honest. And there's a lot of people on that list that I would just like to say, I just never read them. They were never, never influential to me because I'm just too smart for that now, you know, and I want to hide that up. But I, th I think there was a good quote from Karl Barth once that he said, we should have fidelity to the church where our eyes were first open to Christ. And I just felt like that was, for me, it was like a Pentecostal Bible church. It was like the first one um, my parents found in a phone book. You know, they didn't, they weren't really wise. You know, it's kind of like Paul talking about his church, churches they planted, you know, not very noble, you know, there's not a lot of us, a lot of things to really admire, but that's always kind of kept me humble. Uh, so like with John Piper, you know, he was pretty influential at the time because I really just didn't know anything. You know, I just uh, that was the first person who started to gauge with theology. But, you know, later on, you know, he like excommunicated Burger King. And there's been some kind of fruity stuff that, you know, after he retired, 
maybe when you get out of the pulpit, you know, sometimes you just aren't as sharp. Um, but I definitely did learn from him. I read most of his books. Uh, George Eldon Ladd, that was another one at the top of the list. I just, I didn't understand at the time that he basically had just ripped off everything Rudolph Bultmann had written. And he just like baptized it or Bapt Baptist baptized it where they rebaptized something, you know, many times over. And it's just, it's, it's like the clone of a clone is just never as good. But for me at the time, I had just never really been exposed to something more than like Wayne Grudem maybe. Um, so I just had no idea. And that was, you know, pretty revolutionary. Although later on when I actually went to read like Boltmann, which I don't have on my list now, but I would probably include him uh, as a later to list. So I think the point of that one is like, we all have our personal histories. You know, we start off where we are, you know, mm -hmm. eyes are opened in the world and we have a path and some of it we have, you know, nature nurture can kind of move through, but this was the evolution you know, the evolutionary stages I went through, you know, this is one way of thinking than this one. And I actually enjoyed over the years, the fact that like every few years, there was something new that I figured out or learned that I just, you know, was kind of like a paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. And that was really helpful for each of these. So within this list, it kind of ends off with Hans Kuhn. Um, several of these people I've reached out to and was able to contact. I, I actually uh, wrote a letter to Hans Kuhn. He's, you know, he had, Parkinson's, so he couldn't really do too much, but I did get a signed response from him mm. in Moltmann and N.T. Wright. Actually, N.T. Wright rebu rebuked me one time because I criticized one of his books. Oh, and he, really? You know, he said, don't say that. Um, I used to be influenced by D.A. Carson, who's not on the list as well, and he also uh, shunned me as well. I came up oh, to him wow. in person one time at Mars Hill and asked him to sign his like, exegetical fallacies, and he's like, I don't think you can understand my book but I'll sign it anyway. It was like wow. really, really callous. Huh. Yeah. So I think that kind of wound me up to where I was a few years ago. Um, I definitely would add some more people now, uh, like James Cohen, you mentioned, I think that that helped me make sense of all the 220, 2020 mm -hmm. black lives matter. Um, you know, just the liberation theology just gave me a category. I just didn't have mm -hmm. before. And, you know, a lot of things there were just really eye opening. Hans Kung, I left off with him because he was helpful for helping me understand Bart in relation to Catholics that I had read. And I had gone to a lot of fundamentalist churches in the past because that's where I started. And it's, you know, they are the true believers in he of heaven and they are the gatekeepers and everyone else is going to hell, especially the Catholic Church, which is the trunk under them. So he was helpful for not only helping me understand Catholicism, but he wrote a big book on Judaism and a big book on Islam. Mm. They were also really helpful for me uh, as uh, things I ventured into after that list had commenced. And uh, you know, or at least they had got up to that point in the list of my own personal history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, no, that's great. I, I wonder if you could circle back to the, if you can explain some of the N.T. Wright story. That sounds really interesting where he shunned you. Or, I had or a couple a couple times. Um, I, he's got, I, you know, I really love N.T. Wright's books. I still use them. Like I have a, a Bible study with a couple guys I've been doing for a few years. And I usually get them to read books. Right now we're going through Moltmann's uh, new book, The Resurrected. Um, oh, excellent. You know, Undying and Rising, because it's just short enough you can read a page of it and then discuss it without homework. Mm -hmm. um and nt wright has like the new testament for everyone so mm -hmm. it's kind of nice to get like a scholar commentary on it that's kind of still kind of honest that there's problems there without like fully owning the problems mm -hmm. so it's kind of safe i don't get myself in too much trouble yeah but anyways i read uh, jesus and the victory of god mm -hmm. and he actually does a pretty good job of just you know people just automatically think the gospel means you believe jesus is god and it's not a lot of thought to it. It's not Trinitarian, mm -hmm. you know, monotheism, basically. Like Moman said, God's first name is not Monos. You know? So it's, uh, he did a really good job of saying, well, what is the humanity of Jesus? Because that's good Chalc Chalcedonian Christology, mm -hmm. fully man, fully God, you know, yet you have all these different things of like ins insuperable and whatnot yet together. So he goes on and talks about how, Right, Tom Wright goes on to talk about how um, 
Jesus, he didn't know himself being God in the way we, we know our gender, which at that time was much more subtle question than it is today. <laughs> you know, it, um, it, it's, it's not so a matter of fact of male or female. When he wrote, that was just accepted orthodoxy at the time. But mm -hmm. he went on to say, well, Jesus didn't know that. He kind of discovered that he was God through his mission as one discovers one's vocation. Mm -hmm. And I wrote him an email and I said, do you still, you know, believe that Jesus didn't know he was God or something kind of, I didn't mean it to be callous, you know, but mm -hmm. he just, he just snapped back. Like, don't tell people I said that. It's not what I said. And it was pretty harsh, but I mean, I think he was the, the Bishop of Durham at the time. So mm -hmm. I guess I was just happy to, you know, even garner a response from him. Yeah. Um, I had another time he came to Seattle and I asked him some question about universalism uh, it was in light of his book, um, not, not the, the, not the last one on Paul, but, the, the surprise by hope. I think he was mm -hmm. pushing mm -hmm. the time and he just kind of dismissed my question. Like he didn't understand what I was saying, and, you know? And so I, I do enjoy that these theologians will respond to you. You think they don't care. They won't write, but you know, they often will respond if you can find their email, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, yeah. I shook it off. I, yeah. I didn't take it too personal, you know, so. Yeah. yeah, no, that's good. I just, yeah, I was curious. That's, it was fun, really a fun memory, you know. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I, um, I, I remember I read his really long book, um, a while ago and, and kind of had, yeah, different impressions with it. it. It was, he's somebody I've kind of tangentially, uh, read and stuff alongside my other people. But I think for a lot of that stuff, I think Bart Kazeman recently, uh, Baltman are a little bit more of, I think, heavy hitters for, for me, at least. I mean, I, anti Wright seems to straddle that evangelical liberal line a lot. So yeah. I don't know how well that mixes. And so he, uh, he's interesting, but yeah, that's just an interesting story to, to hear about. Um, and so, yeah, so I guess we can move on. Speaking of your background a little bit more, um, since kind of go into evangelical world a little bit, um, it's always interesting to me. I actually, forget this every now and then when I interact with you that you were a pastor at Mars Hill for a time. Um, you recently tweeted about rebaptism at Mars Hill, which I thought was really interesting, that yes. uh, thread. Um, but I, I wonder if you can explain a little bit kind of what led you to Mars Hill and then what led you out of it to where you're now obviously quite critical of Mars Hill um, and kind of, yeah, just a bit of your biography in terms of your relation to that. Yeah, it's quite popular to be critical of Marcel right now, <laughs> especially mm -hmm. afterwards or from afar. Mm -hmm. The dying and rising of or the rise and fall of Mars Hill podcast has been, you know, mm -hmm. sensational. Everyone's reading it or listening to it and following it. I just I have not, to be honest, followed that podcast because I just, it's hard to relive that through yeah. <laughs> everything that's going on. Mm -hmm. You know, I hear people talk about what happened in, in retrospect, and I'm like, you're you're blaming Mark Driscoll, but I know that, you know, they, you enabled him at the same time to do what he did. Mm -hmm. And there was definitely a separation <clears throat> between the people underneath them and who he was that empowered the flaws of that as it imploded. But I think I didn't get drawn to Mars Hill um, because of Mark Driscoll directly. Um, when we first moved to Seattle from Chicago, uh, it was like, uh, late 2008, early 2009, I didn't immediately jump into like a Marcel church, but I did have that Reformed Baptist background to me. And I think I was still pretty ignorant about the Reformed tradition. You know, I didn't know that John Calvin was in favor of infant baptism, you know, just to show my cards, which is like one of his bigger sticks. Mm -hmm. And so um, we tried to go to a couple like Reformed Baptist e churches, but we really kind of decided based on the community that we could find, my wife and I, we didn't have any kids yet at that time. Mm -hmm. And we uh, we went to a Presbyterian church plant in the PCA for a period of time, but it just, we really had a hard time making friendships. So we ended up compromising and going to Mars Hill Eastside. Um, at that time, I didn't really have a lot of experience in ministry. And I didn't really like the video pastor. So I was never really totally on board with it. But I think in terms of like Reformed Baptist theology, if that's a thing, I mean, it, it, it is a thing. Um, mm -hmm. But I kind of came out of you, like you 
brought up, I like John Piper before that, you know, and this is someone who like, first time I saw Mark Guscoli was at the Iron God conference, um, mm-hmm. Tim Keller as well. So I think it was just when we went there, we went to the church and we were able to get involved and they had what they call a community group. It's like, you know, the Wesleyan model, mm-hmm. you know, from Saddleback and everywhere and every mega church. And we were able to make a lot of friends there. And I was able to use some of my te- technical skills from Mars Hill because I am I have an engineering degree uh, from Michigan and they needed help with that. And, you know, I became a deacon pretty quickly just through service. And then there was a bunch of power plays in order to who would be the, you know, the, basically like the campus pastor or who would become the paid people. And I didn't have any desire to be a paid person at Marcel. I already had my own career mm-hmm. as a lay person. So I think it just kind of came up as an opportunity that I could serve at the church and provide critical feedback of Marchesco to the other pastors who were just not well read or informed. So I think they just valued me not because I went along with it, because but because Marchesco would make a pronouncement, I'm like a prophet, or later as apostle, or use Papa, you know, the Pope that was near the end, uh, with the sweater vest and the beard, and they could say, well, why is that true or not? And I would be able to give them some like counter reasons. So they would be, oh, okay, I didn't know that. So it's, it was kind of enabling. Mm-hmm. And then, but where I was really enjoyed being there was the community groups. So as I was in one group that did really well, that I led a community group. Uh, so the a- actual pastoral side of things is where I came to play. Eventually I was, uh, you know, leading basically all of the uh, community groups for the East side, mm-hmm. Marcel campus. It was like 500 people. So there was a big hierarchy. They use like football analogies. It's like head coach, coach, you know, and and so on. Huddles and all these different things. I I don't know, football bastardization, Mm -hmm. if you play. But it was just more practical, you know, Methodism kind of stuff. Um, Mm -hmm. It works, not necessarily biblical. And I just really enjoyed being part of the community. I made a lot of friendships there. Um, but eventually Mark Driscoll had burned through everyone and burned up everything in Ballard. So they decided to come to Bellevue and there was a big building project there that went really sideways with the funding and everything just kind of hit the fan, um, with that. And then that's thing when things started to go downhill and, mm-hmm. uh, I made my exodus out of there for mm-hmm. a number of reasons. Yeah. I, um, that's really interesting. I, I noticed from your earlier list of the 15 that um, you had mentioned you had already started reading BART at the time you were uh, working there as a pastor. And so I was like, when, before you'd even started there, um, how, how did that kind of inform your um, perspective? It sounds like you were kind of the go-to expert to some extent. Is that kind of part of it? Or how, how did BART kind of fit into that that story? Well, I think along with the ignorance. So it was it was definitely a lay-led church, which I think there's a lot of value to that. You know, you get in the PCUSA, you have to be a member for a year. You got to have a seminary degree. Mm. Um, I read George Marston. I really liked his history of America and fundamentalism. And he talked about how the, the, the mainline Protestant churches just didn't do as well in America because it started in New England and the settlements. And they had those requirements for vigorous teaching that just made it it take it took a long time for you to go build a new church establish it with pri- proper people but mm-hmm. if you could just jump on your horse and go be a fire and brom- brimstone preacher you know everyone's thinking about the end of the world with the discovery of the new world that you could move much quicker quick quicker and the missionaries went down and across the southern parts of the united states and they eventually kind of came up in Seattle as like the last. So there's like a poverty of people here that really understood theology. Now there's Fuller had an extension campus, um, but there's there's not a lot of seminaries here. So it's really hard to find people who could do that. So the way that Mars Hill adapted it is they basically would have this idea of, they called it closed hand and open handed issues. It's just really the, the close-handed issues were the ones that Mark Driscoll cared about. They're in his fist, you know, you got your fist up, you know, ready to fight. Those are the ones you don't question. But the other ones, as long as the numbers are going up, they don't really care. It's just not a concern. So you get ignored. 
So what that actually did is create a really good environment for if you wanted to read someone like Karl Barth, going back to your question, mm-hmm. or Moltmann, or Schleiermacher. I remember quoting Schleiermacher um, when I was leaving or handing over the community groups to one of the other pastors. And I got up there and I talked about how Jesus, or what am I saying? Uh, yeah, what Schleiermacher said that Jesus had to leave. He had to be ascended to the Father because that was the only way that the church could come into its own, its own being. Because mm-hmm. um, unless Jesus had ascended into the Father, then it would have been uh, restricted to one location. And then after that, through the power of the Holy Spirit, the church was able to go throughout the end of the earth, you know, ubiquity there, you know, uh, maybe a, a Lutheran or Eucharistic kind of reference there could go everywhere. So what I loved about that is I could go drop Schleiermacher and I wouldn't immediately be called a liberal. Where if mm-hmm. my experience in like the conservative reformed or conservative Presbyterian was much different. It was much more like that letter that Bart wrote to Francis Schaeffer about Van Til. <laughs> mm-hmm. We can talk about that some, maybe when we talk about the next thing on your list. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. So there's Liberty. I could go read these books. I mean, at the mm-hmm. time, like I didn't know who they were, so I was slightly critical as well. Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. what really helped me get into Bart was I had a couple friends who had studied Karl Bart at Fuller and I ran into them at a church and they had a Bible study and they were very patient to listen to me repeat all the stupid criticisms like it doesn't have any pictures in the book how how am i going to read this you know it's got too many words you know it's like you're arguing with a five-year-old or something you know things that people say and that you know they pulled out the hair but you know eventually that got me to actually go read the the source documents Mm -hmm. Mm yeah no that's cool yeah Yeah. that's that's um that's which uh what book did you start with for bart do you remember yeah, I, uh, I was at a bookstore, used bookstore in Redmond, you know, Microsoft land. And they had a copy of the Church Dogmatics Volume 2, uh, both part volumes in mm-hmm. like an old bookcase. Mm-hmm. And I bought them with a coupon, you know, I eventually waited for them to go on sale. Mm-hmm. And so I started with uh, 2-1, mm-hmm. 2.1. And, you know, that's the doctrine of God and also has some ethics that kind of go along with it. But that was the whole idea that there's no natural revelation. And that was pretty mind blowing at the time. And, Mm -hmm. you know, as I read it, I kind of went through a similar thing when I read the institutes, Calvin's institutes as well. Mm -hmm. So similar, but I had to actually read that material. And I think what helped it is it skipped over the word of God, which was where a lot of evangelicals attack him on. Because mm-hmm. they don't like, well, is the Bible a word of God or becomes a word of God? And they have all these like puffed up responses. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was really helpful. And then when I read his book on the election of Jesus Christ mm-hmm. afterwards, I I think what he said about Jesus being the object of election just really made sense of things where I struggled with election in the past of like the nebulousness of it. Mm-hmm. Um, did I really understand it at the time? Uh, my translation, my translations did not have all the small print Latin and Greek translated. So those mm. are the, like the things that were really, you know, the, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, you know, I didn't have those. So I think the first time I went through those, it was a little bit harder for me to understand the, the, the profound and re- genius of Bart in those sections. I mean, both are rightly called the, you know, two, one, the best volume, the, Church dogmatics. I don't know if it was the best for me, but it was it was an absolutely great place for me to start. Mm-hmm. And it just took forever. It was like five years for me to read through all of them. And I, I'm sure you seem like you must have read them much faster. I know you have you're like the only other person I know who's read all the church dogmatics. Yeah, we're in a small group. Um I <laughs> supposedly uh the last person I interviewed, Brock Jennings, he was Maltman's uh, doctoral student. Uh, yes. he's he told me that um even Maltman hasn't read the whole thing, <laughs> which is shocking to me. Um, but Fascinating. Yeah. So we're in an elite group for sure. Um, but no, that's cool. That That's definitely a great two volumes to begin with. I, I think those are definitely among my favorites for sure. Um, I, I was going to ask this later, but might as well ask you now, what uh, do you have a favorite now that you've read the whole thing that you would say is like maybe top three, top one or two that you would 
you go to a lot or something? I mean, it just depends. Um, I think it's, it's kind of like that history that I brought up earlier, our own uh, gestalt in history. Um, there, there's things that you need to hear at certain times in your life. And there's other times when you hear them, you don't, they, they just don't sell yet because you're just not ready to hear them. Or other times you hear them a little bit too late. Uh, George Hunziker made a good point that a lot of people have their guards up with Bart, but in reality, Bart is like the evangelical's best friend. Mm -hmm. I just felt like that, you know, if you're an evangelical, you know, basically which I was when I first started with him, that, you know, who was sympathetic to, you know, Calvin and his successors, his navigation through things like you mentioned, er inerrancy sometimes, just what is the Bible? What do we do with history that doesn't line up? How do we handle things that are uncomfortable? I think, he, you know, if that's where you are, especially like if you're an ex-evangelical, I think he, he can really uh, make a big difference. Um, and I, I know I've heard several ex-evangelicals said that, you know, before they gave up, the ones who became atheists, you know, not all ex-evangelicals are atheists, but mm -hmm. um, from from the ones who who were, they would say that Bart kind of kept them um, and evangelical much longer uh, by reading those. So from where I was at the, at the beginning, I think reading CD2-1 was definitely very impactful. And then, but if I have to go back and look at which one was, you know, I wrestle with most, it'd be CD3-2, uh, which is on, you know, the Christology of Jesus, the person, basically the person in that has those strong eschological sections in there. Mm -hmm. um, those are probably the most unsettling. So it's kind of hard to say which, like, I don't know, you're looking for the best one. Like, what is the best? Is it, is it help you the most? Does it open your eyes the most? Is it, you know, in what way does it inform, you know, your particular history? Um, that one is, you know, I, all of CD three, volume three, I, I think you reading that it, it gets kind of dark and you get kind of, it can be kind of depressing at some parts of it, but you also have to remember Bart is writing this as the Nazis are coming into power. You know, we're all stressed out about Ukraine right now, but that was a real serious issue mm -hmm. <laughs> that was actually unfolding. Hopefully it doesn't go that way for us, but mm -hmm. that was good. And then I just, it just different parts, you know, he revisits, um, you know, the, the secular parables, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in volume four, you know, most recently my daughter was at, who's 12, almost 13. She has a, she has a YouTube channel called the stop motion gnome. So I'll just give a shout out for that one where she does stop motion videos. So mm -hmm. she was excited to hear that I was going to be on a podcast with you. Nice. Um, she had a bunch of questions about angels and like, oh goodness, I got to talk about angels. I usually just kind of roll my eyes about them. Uh, cause I remember going to a Christian bookstore and it'd be Thomas Kincaid, like exploded over the walls with trinkets. And then most of the books would be about angel erotica or something really weird, you know, <laughs> so like crazy stuff, you know? Yeah. Um, so I'm just like, don't, not even interested. But then she's coming to ask me questions about it. Mm -hmm. And I have her reading, uh, David Bentley Hart's the New Testament, and it has a bunch of stuff about demons. And then she's like a modern person and wants to roll her eyes at it. I'm like, well, okay, we got to think about this. And I went back and I reread the Church Dogmatic 3 4. He has a long paragraph on angels and their opponents. And that was really like clarifying for me. So then when I have to talk about that, you know, so right now that was very useful to me. Uh, Angels never does well whenever I post it on the post party and no one cares. <laughs> uh, maybe if I put demons, they'll give a damn. But, you know, angels, is not, you know, eye rolls. It's, they're all the uh, disinterested uh, demythologizers. That's what yeah. um, Bart calls them. I'm like, yeah. Well, I tend to be that way too. So guilty. Thank yeah. You. I don't know. How about you? Is there one that really was most impactful to you? Um, I, I'd probably say... 4-1 tends to be. I mean, that's also like you. That's the one I started with. Um, I kind of got into theology from deconstructing some of the atonement. Um, yes. 
things that I've been taught, penal substitution, especially. And um, so that's what attracted me to BART through TF Torrance was a lot of that. So I, I picked up a I don't even know where I found it, but just that first survey of um, of reconciliation from uh, four four point one. And I picked that up in a small paperback. I, I don't know who published it um and uh read that so that that made a big impact and i think since then i've went back and reread four one and i think it still stands um really all of four was uh, such a masterpiece and it's in Mm -hmm. itself it's kind of a it almost is like a separate like people call it the mini dogmatics right it it really has its own own thing going on um other than that i I would definitely say two one and two two were were really impactful for me um and then um one and three are a little bit kind of downplayed for me for whatever reason, even though I do really like three one, but I, I kind of go between those two, uh, four one and either two two or two one. I kind of go back and forth as well. Um, but I like I like all those as well. So um, it's all good stuff. It's 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 fun to yeah to talk through it because it, it is such a re- resource of there's so much wealth of just information. It's not just like abstract too. I think that's what I've always appreciated with Bart. It's not just very abstract thinking or speculation it has a very um kind of pastoral bent i guess you could say or but just a very applicable uh just it's just a wealth of good information or resources so um yeah that's probably probably the one i'd say but um yeah i didn't read them out of yeah i I continued to read them out of order i tried to jump between them which was really helpful just his writing style i mean there is kind of a hermeneutic to it all and you're right, 4-1 is certainly an epitome of the dogmatics. 3-1, mm-hmm. like, I think at the time, there was a lot of debate over evolution in, in the churches I was in, and no one would really affirm that. And I think reading 3-1 with its commentary on Genesis mm-hmm. was excellent. It just mm-hmm. explains the background, you know, the English uh, Newham, the different kinds of, you know, ancient more older uh, documents and Bart does a really good job of saying how they're like a critique of those. They're not just parroting them. Mm -hmm. And then uh, he mixed that with his word of God as a method and his saga as a method. Mm -hmm. You know, if that's somewhere you're struggling, that would be great. But, Mm -hmm. you know, at this point now, it would be lower on my list of ones to read because it's Mm -hmm. not something I'm really concerned about, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's, um, that's really interesting. So, yeah, I I wanted to ask then. So after you left Mars Hill, I guess going back to um, some more of your personal story, you ended up being a church planner with the Presbyterian Church. Uh, I believe I read is how did that transition happen, and then um, kind of how did you find um, church planning, and and then it maybe what eventually that led you to where you are now. Well, I have to be careful not to recuse myself. Um, so you know, Mars Hill. It, it had a, a big swing down. I remember there was an elders meeting and they announced that they were tightening up the control. So they had their executive elders and Mark Driscoll were the only ones that would basically get power over their bylaws and could make decisions. And there was a big meeting where they brought all the elders together. And, you know, the Driscoll got up there, like he said, for me to let any one of you preach should be like, like, any of you, one of you sleep with my wife. It's, you know, and he laughed about it um, in front of everyone. And then they had a vote like that only the executive elders would have like the control or power of things. And I was the only person who, who voted no on that, especially since one of the persons didn't even live in the state where Marcel was and they were supposed to be the rulers. And I had to be interviewed by one of the other a more senior elders, person who'd been there longer, and just because I don't know, it's uh, getting interviewed by the secret police. I guess it wasn't that bad, but I did get like questioned by all these things mm. just for saying no in an anonymous vote, you know. And I had to like prove myself, and I did kind of turn the questions around. The same guy who came back and was the minion for Driscoll to kind of come question me, and he was like, "Well, I guess you have a point too," but and I think. A little bit later, people realized, well, why you were right to not, you should have, we should have all stood up and then maybe this wouldn't have gotten to where it was. But after that point, things got really secretive and only the executive elders, which is like Mark Cohn, like two other people, basically, 
uh, really had knowledge of what was going on as a whole for the business. And I think people were naive and they kind of assumed the best before the big book deal scandal uh, mm-hmm. went down for, um, you know, buying his way onto, you know, the bestseller lists. Mm-hmm. And then our, you know, all the sermon series became based on his book deals. And then when they came to Ballard, it kind of put the kibosh on, you know, any kind of like kind of local run church. I still had the community groups. It was really good. Mm-hmm. And I think there was quite a few people in the community groups that I worked on, which was on the east side mostly on the north side of it and some of them came together um some of the groups originally wanted to plant a church uh, but mars hill wouldn't allow them because they wanted it to be mars hill branded mm. uh, so when the leaders for those couple church plants left they created a void and then when things fell apart there was kind of like a faction where a group of them went and started a church on the east side that i didn't attend it's still going well today surprisingly because it was, it was actually, uh, I think it was, it was grown by some mature leadership that you know, provided maybe some structure for it to happen, and then there was another group that came together that had a bunch of people that I knew that were friends of mine. And it was a Presbyterian church, conservative Presbyterian church. Um, I won't name it, but um, they went and started a church. I didn't know the leaders, but I knew a lot of the people you know, almost all the people who went to join it who were friends of mine um, from community groups uh, at the east side. So when Mars Hill rolled out the requirement that you had to have uh, do not compete clause, I think it was 70 miles from anywhere there's a Mars Hill church. It basically meant like you cannot go be a pastor anywhere in any major metropolis area without written consent from Driscoll and the and executive elders. Wow. And they called it like a pendulum swinging. All the elders were like, well, it's just swinging this way for a little while, and it'll just swing back the other way. They don't no idea the whole thing was like the Tower of Pisa, you know, you know, it's on its way, <laughs> leaning, and it was going to fall over. Not that the Tower of Pisa fell over, but it mm-hmm. wasn't going to swing back. And I think I my livelihood wasn't dependent upon that, but I didn't want to have that. I didn't want to get into any kind of legal issue with them. So I talked it over with the local elders that I knew at the east side, and I just decided that I didn't want to live through this, the way things were going. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to sign. So I found a peaceful way to go join and help out the church plant that was going. Mm. Um, I don't know. It's kind of like someone who gets divorced and they run into a second marriage and that marriage is worse and they get Mm. divorced again and they're on their third marriage, uh, to put it. But the church that I went to, it was fine for a little bit, but they were all like hardcore, like Vantillian people. There's that letter that Barr wrote Francis Schaefer. He says, you, you have no interest in me or my theology. You're just you're interested in criminology. You're just here to accuse me. You have your orthodoxy. And if I don't align up at one spot, one speck of it, then I'm damned. And mm-hmm. it's your job to go hunt me down and hang me until I'm dead, he says in the letter. Well, yeah, so when I went there, it went okay for a little while because I had all the friendships, mm-hmm. uh, and we contribute a lot in terms of time and service and money to the church, but it was it was a disaster. It was, the church was launched quickly. There wasn't like a pastor that was there from another church who had experience, and it was like the worst sermons you'd ever hear. It'd be like an hour-long sermons that were literally Jeremiah's, or they would read it. And then people, things that I would post on Facebook would show up in sermons and be condemned. And then people start being put out of the Lord's Supper over things that were really petty that were taken out of context. Wow. So it was actually ended up being a really terrible experience. I, I do blame mostly the particular leaders, not the PCA as a whole, or, mm-hmm. you know, not, not naming anyone individually. But basically, Pretty much everyone who we, all the friendships we had from that one are worse now than they were when they came out of it. I, you know, in hindsight, I would never have joined it and the church mm. probably shouldn't have been planted. It should be like absorbed as part of like a more church process. But unfortunately, that's the way a lot of churches go, especially reformed churches. Uh, Marston writes about this, George Marston again. He says the problem with a lot of the conservative reformed churches is that they never grow over 200 people. 
or 250 people because what they do is they spend all their time getting rid of the heretics mm. and it gets very homogenous like all the families at the church had like almost a similar amount of kids they were all you know white uh married couples kids were a similar age so they spend all their time as marzen says getting rid of the heretics and then once all the heretics are gone then they turn on each other like dogs and then the church implodes and if if there was any ever a test case of that i think that's what that went through so eventually i had to make a decision that just i just felt for the safety of my family that i didn't want to subject my wife or kids to the things mm -hmm. that had happened to other people mm -hmm. um that we decided to go to uh, another church in Bellevue, a large PCUSA church. You know, PCUSA, they're like, you know, that's where BART's most popular. You know, um, it's it, it was in many ways, it was, it was like a breath of fresh air. And the first sermon I heard was just about racial reconciliation and peace and loving your enemies. And I was about ready to go into tears, you know, because mm. I couldn't, it just, it just was so revolutionary for me after a couple of years of hearing so much hatred Mm -hmm. in condemnation of you know fellow christians mm -hmm. it's, it's like satan is the accuser of the brethren and we're going to take that as a missionary position in our church <laughs> yeah a model anyways so the church we've been at for the last few years since then has been has been wonderful and um you know they have a lot of things they do for the community and for the kids and i mean church and COVID anywhere is not ideal mm -hmm. but um we, we've been much better than then, but I feel like that could have been an opportunity if I had played the cards differently. Maybe I would get into some other ministry, but uh, to do more pastoral work, I'd like to get back to that. Mm -hmm. But I just would want it to be under something a little more mature. So it kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about the itinerant preachers. That's the opposite danger is you get all these Charles Finney like characters who go preach all kinds of nonsense that tickles the ears and mm -hmm. you get a mega church and uh, maybe it would have been better if it just had never gotten so big or succeeded maybe if it I don't know who, who's to say history it's it's part of my history now mm -hmm. yeah no that's a I think that's a pretty healthy perspective <laughs> not to that. not to be real like negative about it but mm -hmm. I'm just trying to be honest mm -hmm. yeah no, I, I appreciate that for sure. Um, and so you, I, you're back kind of, I guess, just mentioning about your career, you've, you're in the tech world, right? So were you doing that? Because you said your, your um, welfare wasn't tied to your position as a pastor. So you were working along the side as well? Yes, like when I worked for, um, well, when I was a pastor at Marcel, I worked for Expedia. Mm -hmm. I worked on their booking engine. So if you've ever booked a hotel or a flight in the and the thing had an error or crash, it's probably my fault, you know, <laughs> that's a joke I would say, but, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, yeah, I've worked for a lot of big companies. I worked for Intel in the past and Motorola and mm -hmm. um, I work for Microsoft now, okay. not speaking for Microsoft, but I mm -hmm. uh, used to work for a pre-core they were bought by Peloton. So mm -hmm. the, the, those are ones that people might be familiar with in smaller places too. But yeah, I just always done the, the tech, you know, I think there's just something about hermeneutics, you know, writing code and deciphering the code of the Bible requires similar, you know, analogical thinking. Um, yeah. Maybe that's also what has helped me with my blog stuff as well. Mm -hmm. I just, I'm able to understand how Twitter works. How do the Twitter cards go and how do you post it in a way that things get found? And I think that's, help me get my Twitter and my website to do so well. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, I, you know, I had like 50,000 people reading it every month before the pandemic. I've been kind of slowing, slowing down mm -hmm. over the pandemic, just trying to keep up with life with four kids. For sure. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, glad to hear it's doing so well. What um, I was going to ask you as well, what, what, what were kind of the origins of post Bardian? And I, I guess, maybe what was the motivation for, for creating this? Did you have a particular goal in mind or you just kind of wanted to put some thoughts on, on paper, or, uh, hypothetically on paper um, for, for that? Yeah, it's uh, post-Bardian, you know, it's a lot of people use that word. I just, mm -hmm. uh, I was reading, so I, I did get a gift copy of the new McCormick book and he has a whole section about the post-Bardians in there. Mm -hmm. I just felt like he was very careful to use a hyphen, you know, because <laughs> like there was, I mean, obviously he's, he's not thinking about me, 
and but he has a lot, you know Robert Jensen and he named some other people he considered to be post Barian, mm -hmm. um, you know. But you go Google that now. Usually my stuff comes up first, so it's kind of like nice to kind of have an identity. Mm -hmm. um, but other people have used it. My good friend Travis uh, McMacken he wrote um, a book on the infant baptism. Uh, mm -hmm. It was like a post Barian response, so he has the term in there as well. He, he's a he's a great scholar. If you want to look him look him up as well. His uh, Goldwitzer but, books, excellent. I highly recommend. Yes. It. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and well, he knew Bart mm -hmm. uh, personally as his personal assistant. So yeah, that yeah. that was also one of his favorite. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think uh, same thing with uh, David Congdon mm -hmm. in his big book on Bulmon. He talks about post Bardianism. Mm -hmm. So the ter the term has a little bit of flex to it, but really it comes from for me from Moltmann. Um, mm. Jurgen Moltmann said he's not a Bardian, he's a post-Bardian as part of his, um, his testimony, you know, it's called the history uh, testimony might be better because mm -hmm. when he first read Bart, I didn't know he didn't finish reading, but he certainly slams them <laughs> at times. Mm -hmm. He said he wanted to be a mathematician, which is, you know, more analogical thinking. Mm -hmm. And he read Bart and he felt like Bart said everything there is to say, uh, there's nothing left to say. And then he went on to say, well, I actually have things to say. I just didn't realize it at the time. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is born out of his experience, you know, as a part of Hitler's youth mm -hmm. and as a prisoner of war, I think in mm -hmm. Scotland and, you know, how the British chaplain helped him. And that story of Moltmann of who he was, and yet he did um, understand Bart's theology was very helpful for me as a pastor, especially at Mars Hill to, to use that uh, as stories, because everyone likes a good war story, good war history, war history story. Um, but he said, you know, I Moment went on to say, I realize I'm not Barty and I'm post Barty because I'm beyond that. And mm -hmm. I like that moniker, because as you saw on my list, there's a lot of different people. Like I try to have more women and black authors and people who are Asian now or people who are not specifically Christian so that I can learn not to be so anemic. Mm -hmm. um, and post Bardian is why I try to feature not only Karl Bart, but also people are critical of Bart, people who appropriate part of his parts. How, how is he used in other traditions? You know, Bart has, is one of those amazing, amazing theologians that He's just read by everybody. You know, it doesn't matter if you're Pentecostal. Mm -hmm. I, I have a good friend on Vashon Island who has a church and he reads Bart. And then you, you see him, you know, all over the world in every denomination you think of. Um, mm -hmm. It's just like we don't get theologians that are on the Time magazine anymore, you know. Yeah. Um, so I think going on and say post Barnian was I kind of own that. And I said that to a few other people. I think one of the other pastors at Marcel actually said, hey, that's actually, you know, pretty good term. Mm -hmm. um, and when you do post Barthian, you can say it with the H <laughs> mm -hmm. if you want to. So you don't sound as stupid, you know, if you, then if you don't know the H is silent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was like the origin of it, origin of it. And really what happened for it to get going is I just realized I wanted to understand what I was reading and I didn't really have conversation partners. Like you said, it gets to be a small niche of people. The internet makes it much easier now. Um, you, especially like uh, there's like Facebook groups for discussing BART and you get some on Twitter, you get to know certain people. But when I was starting, I didn't have that. And the BART, the, the blog was a way for me to read something and as a way of parsing it, mm -hmm. is it to kind of repeat it back uh, you know, as a narration. Mm -hmm. My wife and I homeschool our children using uh, Charlotte Mason uh, methodology. Mm -hmm. And that's a big part of it is the repetition, making sure that you understood what you read uh, in a way that you can repeat it back. And I think what really helped the blog do well is I was very careful because I didn't want to say things were wrong is to provide very specific like MLA uh, citations for everything I did. Mm -hmm. And I think at first, you know, I didn't do it real well. I just would post like five page quote, you know, <laughs> not edited, you know, I, I realized, you know, working with Mars Hill a little bit more about how do you write things that are only so many words that people are going to read? How do you write them in a way that other people would understand them? So, you know, I moved on from 
self-understanding to like trying to say things that were helpful. Like if I wanted to make a point about something, I could find a theologian that I admired or respected or is respected and have say what I would want to say with their words. And mm -hmm. I think that's been a lot of really useful to other people. And I find my stuff get stolen all the time. Uh, there was just like an issue on Twitter the other day that mm -hmm. some seminary pastor at an SBC had used my James Cone quotes and he didn't put the citation on his syllabus in, in the class. And he mixed in quotes that I had written as if they were James Cone's quotes. Mm -hmm. And then some other pastor who took the course quoted them as if they were James Cone, but they were really just like, they were just being careless and using my stuff. And, and it doesn't bother me that that happened. I just, am, I just enjoy that people are learning more about Bart. Cause like you said, it's, it's, it's gargantuan book to read. Where do you start? How do you do it? There's not really a beginning places, serpentine, you know, like Calvin's labyrinth, you know, it, it keeps you stuck inside of it that you can never get out of it so that you can go talk about the, the minotaur, you know, mm -hmm. you know, of, of what's there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like to, I like to boil it down. There's a lot of people who say that you could summarize Bart's best ideas on one sheet of paper. I heard Michael Horton did that, you know, ironically, you know, he wrote his systematic theology called the, the Christian faith, which is just like Schleiermacher, mm -hmm. which was kind of funny. I, people don't pick up on that, mm -hmm. but I like to uh, debate this with my good friend, uh, Dr. Marty Folsom. He has a face-to-face -face series and he's writing an upcoming series book on Karl Barth that I'm going to have an essay in. And I've been helping him with some of the artwork and stuff for that book series as well. Yeah. So look, look for that from, uh, from Marty Folsom. Mm -hmm. But he would always say like, I don't know if you can really boil down the dogmatics to the one page. So, mm -hmm. I mean, he's, he's more educated than I am. So I, I'll, yeah, I'll take his word for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, that's really good. Um, no, I, I like this that perspective. I know, I mean, I mentioned it earlier as well, but I know for myself that your, your blog's definitely been helpful for me along my journey. Um, and I'm sure countless other people. So it's definitely a service to the church and, um, something I've, I've certainly benefited from. And I know many others have, um, speaking of which I, it was actually, I believe from your, your work on cone that I was first introduced to cones thought, um, and my, my latest book in the plain English series was on James Cone and, and stuff. And so I obviously owe you a debt of gratitude for that, for being introduced to Cone and, and Thank stuff. You. And so we share that interest in Cone. Um, I, you mentioned a little bit earlier about how he was helpful for you through 2020 and the George Floyd issues and Black Lives Matter and stuff. I, I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about maybe how, how he's impacted you personally, how reading Cone even kind of from that post bardian perspective, um, Cone in relation to Bard or, or however you want to approach it, but it just, yeah, how, how, how's, I mean, I, I guess I can speak for myself. Cone's impacted me quite a lot personally and, and theologically, I, I don't think I can do theology anymore going forward without the perspective of liberation. And I think that's definitely thanks to Cone and, um, and his work. Um, like you said, even adding authors that are, or theologians that are black, that are women or of other minorities, um, of oppressed groups is become an emphasis for me because of Cone. And, um, so I wonder if you have any similar experience or, or how have you found, uh, Cone impacted you? Yeah, I just, in the past, just with all the difficulty in evangelicalism, especially, you know, when the rise of Trump, um, I just, I just remember the beginning of that and seeing the, all the stuff about the wall and how we, how we just separate us, you know, from Mexico and the demonizing of people or immigrants. And I just really had, you know, before that, I just didn't even know what I could say about politics. I just felt like I didn't have answers either way. I couldn't pick a side. Mm -hmm. Everyone I knew was like, you have to be Republican if you're, if you're going to be a Christian, you know, otherwise, you know, you can't be a Christian which people, which then I started to hear this language of hating the foreigner, you know, which is like completely contrary to the Bible. You know, it's mm -hmm. Jesus didn't see everyone equal. He didn't love the Pharisees like, uh, like the prostitute. He systematically sided with the people who are suffering. And if I were to think of what would Jesus be like, actually a friend of mine first said this to me. So he um 
you know, if I had to envision what would be like Jesus be like in America, if he came here, he, he probably would have came over in one of the slave ships in the little boxes where you're locked in uh, you know, with like no space to move, you know, and that would, that was who Jesus would be, you know, he, 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 that was, would be people he would go with. I mean, it's hard to say, you know, I'm not trying to like de-Jewish Jesus or remove him. That was definitely the error of, you know, the Nazi theologians and the German Christians when they tried to do that. Mm -hmm. But when I read Cohn, um, what I saw here is how do I apply the liberation theology that I knew from Moltmann? Mm -hmm. uh, the Crucified God was one of the most influential books for me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you see the themes also with Karl Barth as well, you know, his interaction with the Barman Declaration, which is part of the, the Peace USA's uh, creeds, their book of confession includes that work as well, mm -hmm. which I, I love uh, of like, you know, we, can, we can't just allow Hitler to become in power over the church like he did. You know, he, mm -hmm. he became the Fuhrer and leader of all the Protestant churches in Germany. And so with him, with Cohen, I'm like, well, how do I make sense of America today? You know, I like Martin Luther King. So I go read Cohn, and he had a book called uh, The Cross and the Lynching Tree. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's one of his most popular books. It's super easy to read. And I was just trying to make sense of this. Um, this was before all the 2020 stuff happened. Actually, it was earlier, I think 2015 or so, when they were taking down Confederate flags. Mm -hmm. And I was just really disturbed by some theology I had heard previously and the particular church I was talking about where they like this uh, pastor from um, Moscow, Idaho that I won't name, but he wrote a book saying that the, you know, slavery wasn't as bad as people depicted it and we need to get back to paleo confederacy. And I was just appalled when I read that um, and the people supported that and they wanted to have confederate flags. And I was just really moved. There was this one time uh, I think 2015, where there was a woman who I think her name was Newsom, like Bree Newsom, uh, took down the Confederate flag uh, in, I think it was South Carolina uh, capitals. And she climbed the flag and there was a white guy who attended her and they took it down. And I just thought that was like a great symbol of overcoming America's original sin, you know, America's history, you know, Black history is this month, but black history is US history. It's all our history, you know? So it's, it, it, you just can't ignore it. So what I liked about the James Cone book is that cross and the lynching tree, it kind of shows the parallel of Jesus on the cross mm -hmm. and how there was like an even last 60, 70 years or so, there still was a massive amount of lynchings that happened in the United States. You know, it's a tree as well. Mm -hmm. There's that song about strange fruit, which talks mm -hmm. about, you know, people that were hung on the trees. Uh, and the book itself just goes through all these in, uh, examples of places in, in US history. A lot of them very recent, where it just shows the oppression and examples of it. You know, it, it cites like movies with people in blackface, uh, you know, and glorification of the KKK and all these things that we kind of like to pretend they're not there. And there's a lot of this that's just baked into being a white person in America today that I just, when I read it, I just, I just felt like there was nothing I could say to response. Like, I'm like, you're right. And I can't even like change who I am in order to fix it because it's so engraved in the society around us. Mm -hmm. And that also got just confirmed by like, when you try to talk about Cone to other people who only know, don't know about that, or they don't want to acknowledge it, they, people get really angry about it. And you kind of see, oh, I can see why his theme of anger made sense. Mm -hmm. And that you go, she read the gospel, especially that passage in Luke, where Jesus uh, declares the, the deliverance of the captives, you know, um, and that as his mission and how he went uh, to, you know, cross silently, you know, and he was crucified for it. It wasn't, it was, it wasn't a peaceable kingdom, you know, as Moltmann said, it was a peacemaking kingdom through the cross. Mm -hmm. Um, so like, as I read him, I just felt like that really made sense of America's history and it helped me under having him a cipher. And when you get in the fast forward to 2020 with 
George Floyd, you're like, oh, you can see all these things that he was talking about are just playing right out, just as he said. <laughs> and I can see now, like, oh yes, I should be, uh, I should believe the victims first. You know, not not just you know, black people, but you know, women as well. I have a daughter. You know, my wife. I think about them. You know, we're white people. I work for Microsoft. I'm not really in a place that I could even understand what it'd be like. Um, Microsoft had um, a seminar the other day where a woman was talking about how the about the Tulsa massacre. Like I didn't even know about that because it wasn't even included um, in in the history books I'd read. They were just completely that way. And then you go back and you read the other people. Like I love Jonathan Edwards because that's who was the main guy for John Piper. And then you, lo and behold, he, he, he defended slavery. He had slaves and no one talks about that ever. It's not even mentioned as if it, he gets a pass just because, you know, he's such a good theologian, you know. Um, not, not to say people, you can't read Edwards with his faults. I mean, every theologian, like including Bart, um, almost everyone, if they haven't been caught, you know, the, the, there's usually something really bad scandal about them. It'd be impossible to do theology. Uh, despite it, but I think there needs to be a recogni recognition of it. Mm -hmm. And I also, what I liked about Cohn is he not only helped me understand Martin Luther King better, but he made me read Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I was also trying to understand Islam. And he was in a form of Islam um, with Elijah Muhammad. And he said that people, white people, don't like uh, Malcolm X because they're afraid of him. They like Martin Luther King because it tells people just to be quiet and not to protest. And sometimes there's a time for protest. And that aligned well with what Moltmann had said about we need a vision of not only people who are peaceable or peacemaker, or peaceful living people who don't go to war, but you also need peacemakers because they need images of each other um, so that the people who are trying to fight for peace can remember what peace looks like the people who have peace, this is Moban's story, paraphrase, can can be have hope that, that those people who oppress them will be overcome. Mm -hmm. And that Malcolm X and Martin Luther King are kind of like that same dialectic uh, mm -hmm. come about and how he used those and throughout his books. And I just really, uh, really enjoyed what he had said. And a lot of the time, though, it's a little bit troubling for me because I just feel like I just can't really speak. I can't say, yeah, James Cohn is right as well, where I'm part of the problem. But I feel like it's good at least to, to share what he said in his own voice. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like that really helped me make sense with the George Floyd stuff, mm -hmm. uh, Rihanna Taylor. And, you know, you, you could quickly see like, well, there's just so many of these that it makes sense. Uh, and I just need... I just need to repent as I of the things I had said. And, uh, and if I hadn't a red cone, I just feel like I would could have fallen into the same rut that like the German Christians did. They just went along with the state, you know, and they just didn't think about Jesus as being Jewish. And then that was a disaster. Uh, Karl Barth said in a video that it was like they were asleep and they needed to be woken up, you know. So, yeah. yeah. That's, that's yeah, cool. but how, how do you summarize James Cohn? I don't know. I wrote him a letter. I said he was thankful for his works. Yeah, I just, I figured, I didn't know what he'd respond to me based on his books, but he wrote me back before he had died. Just the letter. I think he was written by his assistant that he was just appreciated that I had read him. It was kind of, he didn't slam me or he wasn't mean to me like the others. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's great. I I appreciate that perspective. I, I know it's similar for me. I James Cohn was extremely helpful. He's one of those theologians that, I, I think sometimes people will read theology to as kind of a self-comforting uh, thing. You, you're reconfirming Marxist what you already kinda, believe. Yeah. yeah and, and opiate. Yeah, a bit of an opiate. Yeah, for sure. And um, I I think Cone's one of those ones that's that's the big splash of cold water to the face. It's a huge wake up call, uh, really challenging. Um, but there's there's still comfort within that challenge. I think that's that's part of what I appreciate about him too, is his work kind of like Bard, I would say has a doxology element. It's, it's praise of the God of justice who, who truly cares for, for the oppressed and is on their side. And I think that's, that's something really beautiful. Um, but yeah, no, I appreciate that. Um, 
we can kind of get wrapped up here. I've really appreciated talking today, but I just have a couple questions, just very simple ones. Uh, is there sure. anything that you're reading right now that, that you found quite good or what, what, who are you reading or what's kind of your study right now? Um, well, I had talked about some themes that I was trying to understand, um, you know, making sense of, of the world. I think I've slowed down some of my reading, um, over the pandemic, just because my kids are at home and my free time, I normally would spend reading. I've had to go do third grade math or mm. fifth grade math, <laughs> um, you know, learning how to do exponents and whatnot. Um, but yeah, you know, I mentioned the McCormick book I'm reading. I had recently read Robert Jensen's uh, Systematic Theology in two parts. Uh, I was also reading um, The New Jim Crow, which is really eye opening. Mm. book about segregation in the form of the prison system in America. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are just some other books that are random, just trying to understand, like I mentioned, James Cone is for, you know, Black America, but there's also women, mm -hmm. like Dorothy Soleil was into her for a while, and mm -hmm. also for people who are LGBTQ, um, you know, and, and all the letters through like James Boswell and things, because that was one that was hard for me for a while because they were a target and a specifically target of some of the fundamentalist churches I had been at, you know, my fundamentals, I'm talking about churches who like to be called fundamentals, you know, and they would specifically pick on people who already are suffering. You already have such a stigma and problem society. The last thing we need, you know, is another Pharisee out there and just trying to go back and reread those. And then I didn't mention with Cone, but he talks about, calls them Mara Indians, but Native Americans, uh, you know, trying to be conscious of that because there's a lot of uh, Native American tribes in Washington state. Uh, so just trying to understand some of the, the suffering and poverty and, and ways they've been taken advantage of um, has been conscious on this whole theme of, you know, liberation of siding with the oppressed against the oppressors. And it goes back to Moltmann. So I'm always circling back to him um because he's you know the the, the hope for the, the the person who was victimized is not only that they would be brought to justice you know no justice no peace but momon goes on to say we have to liberate the victim victimizer from their, their victimizing as well so that there is actual reconciliation mm -hmm. so i think that goes in the trends of like universalism mm -hmm. uh, so I was reading some of D.B. Hart, you know, everybody is reading him, you know, it's hard not to. Mm -hmm. He had a pretty good book that all shall be saved. I really enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. He talks about the, the universalist uh, church fathers who are more merciful than their own God <laughs> mm. in the way that they put, you know, it's like um, Buddhism, the Bolshevita, I can never slaughter that word as well. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so I, I'm really hoping to gear up um, the Postbardian blog again. So I'm excited to mm -hmm. talk about you. I feel like there's a lot of things that I've talked about in the past that I need to come back and say again in light mm -hmm. of today in a new way. Um, that was Karl Barth's definition of worship is that mm -hmm. we hear what God has said and corporately repeat back what he, he has revealed or God has revealed in God's self to us. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't even over gender God there, but mm -hmm. um, uh, no, that's awesome. But yeah. So yeah, I can, I, we'll see. Keep keep checking the postbardian.com, mm -hmm. uh, the Twitter for postbardian. And once I really ramp up, I I'll, I'll, should be posting things on the Facebook as well. But that's usually lower on my list. Yeah. Great. No, yeah, that's it's exciting. I'm excited for new stuff coming out. Um, I, like I said, I've always appreciated stuff. So thank you again for that. And thanks for joining me today. I really enjoyed chatting and thanks for taking the time. And um, yeah, everybody check out post and likes to follow you and all that. Great. It's been, a, it's been a blast. I really enjoyed it. We'll have to do it again sometime. Yeah, definitely. So great. Well, take care and have yeah. a good night. Yeah. And that's, I always like to say uh, grace and peace, my friend. <laughs> yes, likewise. That's all right. All right. Bye. Bye.